Chen Wu is a technical services manager at AOCS. She is responsible for data analysis and reporting, method development, and quality control in the technical team. She ensures the laboratory proficiency program is compliant with ISO 17043, and the certified reference material program is compliant with ISO 17034. Before joining AOCS, she was an associate scientist at Intertech. She holds a master's degree in analytical chemistry from the University of Arizona. Now we have Shen Wu. We'll talk about the statistical treatment of proficiency testing data and how to interpret laboratory proficiency re reports. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the presentation. My name is Shen Wu. I work in the Technical Services Department of ALCS. This presentation is prepared to be informative to potential or existing participants in the ALCS Laboratory Proficiency Program. I'm going to dive into more details on how a report looks like in our Laboratory Proficiency Program. The Laboratory Proficiency Program is one of the services offered by the Technical Services Department of ALCS. The Technical Services Department offers the official methods and recommended practices of the ALCS, the proficiency testing programs, and the certified reference materials. While the certified labs program focuses on soybean meal testing, the Laboratory Proficiency Program has about 40 different series. The Approved Chemist Program and the Quality Reference Materials are extensions from the Laboratory Proficiency Program. From a participant's perspective, the Laboratory Proficiency Program goes through five steps. Register, receive samples, test samples, submit results, and review report. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the last part, review report. This report is published every quarter. The report has four parts. Test results summary, summary of z-scores, chart of z-scores, and the kernel density plot. You could review your results submitted in the test result summary. You could find out how well you did in the summary of z-scores. The chart of z-scores and the kernel density plot are provided for better visual comparison of the results across labs. The first part of the report is the test result summary. This is where all the submitted results are listed. Here is an example of the test results summary page. When reading a report, the first thing I recommend to do is to check the top left and the top right corners. At the top left corner, there is the report title. At the top right corner, there is the sample name. When you are participating in more than one series, or when there are more than one samples in a series, checking the top left and the top right corners can keep you from reading the wrong report. The next thing to do is to find your submitted results in the report. Go down the first column on the left to locate your analyst number, and then go across to find your submitted results. Each constituent is assigned one column. To sum it up, in this first part of the report, test results are listed. The second part of the report is the summary of z-scores. This is where the z-scores and other summary statistics are listed. As always, you could locate the sample name at the top right corner. Let's first look at the z-scores. To find your z-score, go down the first column to locate your analyst number, and then go across 
to find your z-score for each constituent. Say if you find a z-score of 1.23, what does that mean? When the absolute value of a z-score is less than 2, it is considered to be acceptable. When the absolute value of a z-score is between 2 and 3, it is considered to give a warning signal. When the absolute value of a z-score is greater than 3, it is considered to give an action signal. In the report, when the absolute values of z-scores are between 2 and 3, they are highlighted in yellow. When the absolute values of z-scores are greater than 3, they are highlighted in red. Why do z-scores have such implications? When the measurements are carried out correctly and generate normally distributed results, the z-scores are normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. The absolute value of the z-score tells you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. Only about 0.3% of z-scores are expected to fall outside the range of minus 3 to 3, and about 5% of z-scores are expected to fall outside the range of minus 2 to 2. This implication is consistent with the calculation of z-scores. The z-score is calculated by taking the difference of the test result and the assigned value, and dividing that difference by the standard deviation. In the report, the assigned value is the consensus value. The standard deviation is the target standard deviation. Both values are determined according to ISO 13528. How about the other values in the summary statistics? The ones circled in blue are all calculated from the ones circled in green. For example, the relative standard deviation is the target standard deviation divided by the consensus value. The lower limit of tolerance is the consensus value minus two standard deviations. To sum it up, the second part of the report contains the z-scores, which are useful in monitoring the performance. The third part of the report is the chart of z-scores. It is essentially presenting the z-scores given in the second part of the report in a chart, where the x-axis is the z-score, the y-axis is the analyst number. The chart of z-scores makes the comparison of z-scores across labs straightforward. To find your triangle in the chart, locate the analyst number on the left of the chart and then go across to find your z-score for each constituent. In the chart, the greater the magnitude of z-scores, the longer the length of the triangles. And the triangles are coded in different colors for their different implications. Blue for acceptable, yellow for warning, and red for action. To sum it up, the third part of the report provides charts for z-scores. The fourth part of the report is the kernel density plot. It is describing the distribution of the dataset. In the plot, the x-axis is the test result. The y-axis is the probability density. The peak of the plot is where the values are concentrated. The kernel density plot provides a visual summary of the reported values, and it contains information from the first and the second part of the report. The green cross here is where the consensus value is. And there's at least one test result associated with each circle. At where the values are concentrated, especially at the peak of the plot, 
because so many values land at one place in the plot. One circle could represent multiple values. The color band at the bottom of the plot is coded similarly as the triangle in the chart of this course. Blue for acceptable, yellow for warning, and red for action. To sum it up, the fourth part of the report provides graphs to describe the data distribution. Now we have viewed the four parts in a report. The results are listed in the test results summary. The performance measurements, the z-scores, are listed in the summary of z-scores. The cross-lab comparison of these scores are made easier by the chart of these scores. And the data distribution is presented by the kernel density plot. In addition to the report we just viewed, there is also the proficiency report. The report we have viewed is published each quarter, and the proficiency report is published each year. At the end of each program year, you will see the proficiency report available. The proficiency report has the performance summary, which determines if an analyst is qualified for the approved chemist status. The approved chemist program is the extension from the laboratory proficiency program. The proficiency report has two parts, the proficiency report and the ranking report. The first part of the report is the proficiency report. The proficiency report lists the combined score, the number of missing constituents, and the root mean square z scores calculated for each constituent. The combined score is an assessment of the performance over the year. It is the weighted average of the root mean square z scores of the constituents. If an analyst has a combined score of less than 1.4 and has no missing constituent, the analyst is qualified to apply for the approved chemist status. The second part of the report is the ranking report. It lists the analyst number in order of increasing combined scores, and only analysts with no missing constituents are listed. Therefore, if an analyst listed in the ranking report has a combined score of less than 1.4, the analyst is qualified to apply for the approved chemist status. We have viewed the report and the proficiency report. We have discussed what information is available in each part of the report. Thank you again for coming to the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we will have some questions. If you do have any questions for Shin, please put those in the question box. All right, we'll start off with, uh, for Shin, what action should be taken if the result gives an action signal? Um, the action to take would be to investigate the results severally. For example, first look for curric errors check if the results submitted online are correctly entered, check if the results used are with the correct units. Um, second, check the sample. For example, check the sample. If the samples analyzed are the correct samples and are they in good condition. Third, check for possible operation errors. Uh, look at the steps that could e easily introduce an error and see if they are carried out correctly. Uh, review region logs. Are the correct regions used? Are the regions in good condition? Also review instrument records. Are the instrument in good condition and performing as expected? Uh, and so on. So the action to take is to have a thorough investigation of the results, which should help for later correction and prevention. Thank you, Shen. So it sounds like if um, anybody ever has results that are outside of the um, expected norm, um, it really is a practice to go through, you know, really every part of 
um, your lab from just a data entry part all the way through, you know, taking a step-by-step -step look through your method to make sure that everything is really following what should be done in the official method. Yes, yes thank you. Exactly. Um, the next question uh, is around um, how do you participate in the AOCS LPP and approved chemist program? So how does that participation, um, how can you actually do that participation? Uh, so you can go on to the LCS website. Uh, let me, I can actually pull out the website. So you can go onto the website and navigate to laboratory services um, and then click on the LPP, laboratory proficiency program. So we have a list of programs around 40, 40 programs. You need to go through that list to find what you need and uh, follow the steps and you can register get registered and start participation. And for the approved chemist program, the same thing, go to the LCS website where you find the LPP, you can also see the approved chemist program. So you can, after party, actually it's after participation in the LPP program, you get to be able to participate or apply for the approved chemist status. That's right. Yes, so it's um, it's really taking the status and how well you've done in the LPP, and then using that then to apply to be in the um, to be an approved chemist. So, and again, like like Shen said, um, the AOCS website has all that information, um, and anybody there would be you know happy to discuss with with you on how to um, participate in that. Um, and I, I know from experience, I mean, I, we've participated in that for many, many years, and it's a great program that really is helpful for the lab. And um, I'm also the chair of the LPP, so I'll put that plug in there too, because it is, like I said, it's a really, really good program that provides great results for your lab um, to be able to look at data that's compiled from many people in the in industry and other labs um, doing the exact same methods you are. Um, to really make sure that you are in agreement with labs as a whole. Okay, that is all the questions that I'm seeing here right now. Um, I will just say again, thank you to Shen for presenting this. I think the LPP is, like I said, it's very helpful for everyone. And um, the, the data that we get out of the LPP can be so helpful and just the, the great way even the reports are presented. I think is a very actionable and um, thorough way that you know we can see how what the data looks like. It's very visual. I, I really appreciate the the reports that come out of that program too. Okay. If there are no other questions right now, then um, I think we will adjourn this uh, session. I thank everybody for joining today, and I thank Scott and Shen uh, for their uh, presentations. This was very helpful, very informative, and I hope it sparks some more conversation around AOCS methods and um, statistical treatment of this data. I think these are two are very, very important areas that AOCS really is helpful for our industry in. So again, thank you all for participating and thank you, Scott and Shen, for your presentations. Thank I wish you, everyone had a great day. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.